Welcome to Understanding Chapter 2, Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. This video is part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. So Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas is probably the best Bitcoin textbook in existence. The second edition has been out since 2017. It's solid from a content and technical perspective. And there's a free version of the book uh, under a Creative Commons site license under, available on the GitHub site that we will be taking a look at. And all that stuff is licensed under a Creative Commons license, and this video is also covered by that license. So chapter two covers how Bitcoin works. Um, we'll start off by taking a look at transactions, blocks, mining in the blockchain. So the Bitcoin system, unlike traditional banking and payment systems, is based on decentralized trust. Instead of a central trusted authority, like a bank or a credit card company, in Bitcoin, trust is achieved as a property from the interactions of the different participants in the Bitcoin system. In this chapter, uh, the authors cover Bitcoin from a high level by tracking a single transaction through the Bitcoin system and watch as the transaction becomes trusted and accepted by the Bitcoin concept of distributed consensus and the transaction is finally recorded on the blockchain, which is the distributed ledger of all the transactions. Subsequent chapters in the textbook will delve into the technology behind transactions, the network, and mining. So here's an overview of Bitcoin. In the overview diagram, we see that the Bitcoin system consists of users with wallets containing keys and transactions that are sent across the network and miners who produce through this competitive computation, the consensus blockchain, which is the authoritative ledger of all transactions. So each example in this chapter is based on transactions made on the Bitcoin network, simulating the interactions between users by sending funds from one wallet to another. While tracking a transaction to the Bitcoin network to the blockchain, uh, we're gonna take a look at a technology referred to as a blockchain explorer to visualize each step. A blockchain explorer is a web application that operates the Bitcoin search engine and then it allows you to search for addresses, transactions, and blocks and see the relationships between them. So if we look at this diagram here, you know, you can see uh, users. Uh, over here, we've got uh, blocks in the blockchain. Uh, we've got network nodes where blocks are being mined and broadcasted. We've got exchanges that are transferring Bitcoin for dollars. Uh, you've got a transaction that's from somebody to somebody else signed by a private key. We've got merchants that are allowing you to buy stuff for Bitcoin. And then you've got a miner that mines those transactions, produces a block, and then that block gets added to the blockchain if this is the block that wins the award. Um, and we've got some links here to several different types of blockchain explorers. Um, this textbook was written four years ago, so there's many other explorers besides these, and some of these have already been purchased and been combined or, uh, or gone out of business already. Uh, each of these blockchain explorers has a search function that can take a Bitcoin address, a transaction hash, a block number or a block hash and retrieve corresponding information from the Bitcoin network. With each transaction or block example, uh, the textbook provides a URL so you can look it up yourself and study it in detail. And I'll actually show you a couple examples of that during this chapter. So our first example is Alice buying a cup of coffee. So Alice is a new user who just acquired her first Bitcoin from Joe. Alice met with her friend Joe to exchange some cash for Bitcoin, a transaction created by Joe funded Alice's wallet with 0.1 Bitcoins. Now Alice will make her first retail transaction, buying a cup of coffee at Bob's Coffee Shop in Palo Alto, California. Bob's Cafe recently started accepting Bitcoin payments by adding a Bitcoin option to its point of sale system. The prices at Bob's Cafe are listed in the local currency, US dollars, but at the register, customers have the option of paying in either dollars or Bitcoin. Alice places her order for a cup of coffee and Bob enters it in the register, as he does for all transactions. The point of sale system automatically converts the total price from US dollars to Bitcoin at the prevailing market rate and displays the price in both currencies. Now, this is an example from eight years ago. So the values are very different from what the conversion rates are today. So in this particular case, um, you know, $1.50 is the equivalent of 0 0.015 BTC. Uh, today's uh, conversion rate is considerably different. Bob's point of sale system will also automatically create a special QR code containing a payment request. 
Unlike a QR code that simply contains a destination Bitcoin address, a payment request is a QR encoded URL that contains a destination address, a payment amount, and generic description such as Bob's Cafe. This allows a Bitcoin wallet application to pre-fill the information used to send the payment while showing a human readable description of the user. You can scan the QR code with Bitcoin wallet application to see what else would see. Um, the payment request QR code encodes the following URL, which is defined in one of the Bitcoin improvement proposals. So here we've got a Bitcoin address, you get an amount, a label, and a message. Hey, we're purchasing something from Bob's Cafe. And so you've got the Bitcoin address, the payment amount, the label, and the description of the payment. Alice uses her smartphone to scan the barcode on display. Her smartphone shows a payment of 0.015 BTC to Bob's Cafe and selects send to authorize a payment. Within a few seconds, uh, Bob sees a transaction on the register completing their transaction. In the following sections, we'll examine this transaction in more detail. We'll see how Alice's wallet constructed it, how it was sent across the peer-to-peer -peer network, how it was verified, and finally how Bob can spend that amount in subsequent transactions. The Bitcoin network can transact in fractional values uh, from one one thousandth of a Bitcoin down to one one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, which is the smallest amount and is known as a Satoshi. So, so throughout this textbook, we're going to be talking about Bitcoins, but it could be a small fraction, like the smallest unit, to a very large number. You can examine Ellis's transaction to Bob's Cafe on the blockchain using a block explorer, um, and I'm going to show you that in one minute. So here's a blockchain explorer. This one is uh, blockchain.com. And they've got several different technologies. They're gonna exchange a wallet and explorer. Um, and we're looking at the explorer part and you can type in an address into this search and it'll pop up the transaction. And here we have uh, the transaction. In this particular case, we're seeing uh, the one Bitcoin. And this is when Alice is using 0.015 BTC to buy her cup of coffee. And then there's a second address over here, which is the change. Uh, basically the way a Bitcoin transaction works is you send somebody an amount of Bitcoin, like say you take a $20 bill out of, out of your wallet and you give them that amount of money. And so they receive the amount they need for the purchase. In this case, 0.015 uh, is like you know $1.50 for a cup of coffee. And then the change goes back to the person who had it originally. Uh, in which case, you know, if they had a $20 bill, they'd give $18.50 back. Well, in this case, they had 0.1 BTC and they're getting 0.045 back. Um, there is something referred to as a fee, and we'll talk about that later. But you can kind of think of that almost like tax, uh, in that this fee is going to the people who run the blockchain, the miners. Um, and that's an amount that doesn't go to the merchant and doesn't go to you as change. So it's kind of like tax in a way. Um, and there's some more details you can see in the Explorer uh, listed here. And we'll go over those details later when we go deeper into uh, understanding transactions. All right, so continuing on with our discussion of Bitcoin transactions, after looking at that Explorer example, in simple terms, a transaction tells a network that the owner of some Bitcoin value has authorized the transaction of that transfer of that value to another owner. The new owner can now spend the Bitcoin by creating another transaction that authorizes the transfer to another owner and so on in a chain of ownership. In a way, this is very similar to you know, signing a check to send some payment to someone else. All right, so transaction inputs and outputs. Transactions are like lines in a double entry book, bookkeeping ledger. Each transaction contains one or more inputs, which are like debits against a Bitcoin account. On the other side of the transaction, there are one or more outputs, which are like credits added to a Bitcoin account. The inputs and outputs, debits and credits, do not necessarily end up in the same amount. Instead, outputs add up to slightly less than inputs, and the difference represents an implied transaction fee, which is a small payment collected by the miner who includes a transaction in the ledger. A Bitcoin transaction is shown as a bookkeeping ledger entry and transaction as double entry bookkeeping. The transaction also contains proof of ownership for each amount of Bitcoin whose value is being spent in the form of a digital signature from the owner, which can be independently validated by anyone. In Bitcoin terms, spending is signing a transaction that transfers value from a previous transaction over to a new owner 
identified by a Bitcoin address. And here's an example showing this double entry bookkeeping. Uh, we've got four inputs coming in, the total up 0.55 BTC. We have three outputs going out, the total up 0.5 BTC. And the difference between these two becomes the transaction fee. In this case, it's a 0 0.05 uh, BTC that goes to the miner. And so you can do the subtraction here, inputs minus outputs gives us this implied transaction fee. Uh, Alice's payment to Bob's Cafe uses a previous transactions output as its input. In the previous chapter, Alice received Bitcoin from her friend Joe in return for cash. That transaction created a Bitcoin value locked by Alice's private key. Her new transaction to Bob's Cafe references the previous transaction as an input and creates new outputs to pay for the cup of coffee and receive change. The transactions form a chain where the inputs from the latest transaction correspond to outputs from previous transactions. Alice's private key provides a signature that unlocks those previous transaction outputs, thereby proving to the Bitcoin network that she owns the funds. She attaches the payment for coffee to Bob's address, thereby encumbering that output with the requirement that Bob produces a digital signature in order to spend that amount. This represents a transfer of value between Alice and Bob. This chain of transactions from Joe to Alice to Bob is illustrated in a diagram here showing a chain of transactions. So here we've got the first transaction where um, you know, Joe is sending 0.10 BTC over to Alice. Um, then we've got Alice is sending 0.10 BTC to two different outputs. Uh, 0.015 is going to Bob and then she's receiving change for 0.0845. And then there's some transaction fees. And now Bob has his 0.15 BTC that he can spend uh, on some money somewhere. In this case, he's going to send some BTC, 0 0.01 BTC to GoPash, and then he's going to get some change back, and there will also be transaction fees. Um, so let's talk about change. Many Bitcoin transactions will include outputs that reference both an address of a new owner and an address of the current owner, which is referred to as a change address. This is because transaction inputs like currency notes can't be divided. You know, if you purchase a $5 item in a store, but use a $20 bill to pay for the item, you expect to receive $15 in change. The same concept applies to Bitcoin transaction inputs. If you purchase an item that costs five Bitcoin, but only had a 20 Bitcoin input to use, your wallet would create a transaction that sends two outputs. One output of five Bitcoin to the new owner and one output of 15 Bitcoin change back to yourself. This change address does not happen to be the same address as that of the input address. And for privacy reasons, it's often a new generated address from the owner's wallet. You know, there's a best practice of always using new addresses to make it harder to track what's going on from a currency perspective. Different wallets may use different strategies when aggregating inputs to make a payment requested by a user. These different wallets, you know, are created by programmers who may use different algorithms. Um, the programmers might, create wallets that aggregate many small inputs or use one uh, input that's equal to or larger than the desired payment. Unless the wallet can aggregate inputs in such a way to exactly match the desired payment plus transaction fees, the wallet's gonna need to generate some change. This is very similar to how people handle cash today. If you always use the largest bill in your pocket, you'll end up with a pocket full of loose change. If you only use the loose change, you always have a lot of big bills. People subconsciously find a balance between these two extremes, and Bitcoin wallet, wallet developers are striving to put this into their programming. So in summary, transactions move value from transaction inputs to transaction outputs. An input is a reference to a previous transaction's output, showing where the value is coming from. Transaction usually includes an output that directs a single value to a new owner's Bitcoin address and a change output back to the original owner. Outputs from one transaction can be used as inputs in a new transaction, thus creating a chain of ownership as the value is moved from owner to owner. The most common form of transaction is a simple payment from one address to another, which often includes some change return to the original owner. This type of transaction has one input and two outputs and is shown here. You know, a common transaction is from Alice, signed by Alice's digital signature. Output zero is going to a merchant like Bob, and output one is to change address back to Alice. Another common form of transaction is one that aggregates several inputs into a single output. This represents the real world equivalent of exchanging a pile of coins and currency notes to a single larger note. 
transactions like these are sometimes generated by wallet applications to clean up lots of smaller amounts that were received as change for payments. So here we've got, uh, on the left-hand side, we've got a bunch of inputs. In this case, zero, one, two, and so on, all the way down to input N. And then you only have a single output. And in some cases, this is just the, the output. All this is owned by the same person. We're just converting all our pennies into like a penny roll of 50 pennies. Um, finally, another transaction form that's often seen on the Bitcoin ledger is a batch transaction, which distributes one input to multiple outputs representing multiple recipients. Uh, a technique called transaction batching. This is type of transaction is useful for saving in transaction fees. It might be used for payroll payments to multiple employees or where you're processing multiple withdrawals in a single transaction. So here we've got one large payment and many outputs. This could be many different people or it could be um, most likely it's many different people. Um, all right, let's talk about constructing transactions. Uh, Alice's wallet app which is our client-side application storing the Bitcoin at addresses, contains all the logic for selecting appropriate inputs and outputs to build a transaction to Alice's specification. Alice only needs to specify a destination and amount, and the rest has ha happened automatically by the wallet application without her having to see the details. A wallet application can construct transactions even if it's offline like writing a check at home and later sent, mailing it into the bank in an envelope, the transaction does not need to be constructed and signed while connected to the Bitcoin network. So Alice's wallet application will first have to find inputs that can pay the amount she wants to send to Bob. Wallets generally keep track of all the available outputs belonging to addresses in the wallet. Therefore, Alice's wallet would contain a copy of the transaction output from Joe's transaction, which was created in exchange for cash. A Bitcoin wallet application that runs as a full node client actually contains a copy of every unspent output from every transaction in the blockchain. This allows the wallet to construct transaction inputs as well as quickly verify incoming transactions as having correct inputs. However, because a full node client takes up a lot of disk space, most user wallets run lightweight clients that track only the user's own unspent outputs. If the wallet application does not maintain a copy of unspent transaction outputs, it can query the Bitcoin network to receive this information. Using a variety of APIs available by different providers or by asking a full node using an API application program interface call. Look up, you know, you can look up all the unspent outputs for Alice's Bitcoin address, and that'll show an API request constructed as an HP git command to a specific URL. And the URL will then return all the unspent transaction outputs at the address, given any application the information it needs, construct transaction inputs for spending. Um, so here's the example, it's a curl HTTPS command, and it's basically asking this question for unspent outputs. And the response shows one unspent output um, under the ownership of Ellis's address. Now, this is what was written at the time of the book, uh, which was originally published as, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, at this point in time, there's actually more address uh, out, unspent outputs out there as well. So if we click over here on this address, we can see Ellis's address here in the Explorer, and we can see there's actually been 13 transactions, uh, and there's been, you can look through all the addresses, and we can see that there's actually several unspent outputs in here. Um, but let's go back to the textbook. Uh, at that time, there was only one. As you can see, Alice's wallet contains enough Bitcoin and um, spent output to pay for the cup of coffee. Um, and therefore they could go ahead and pay for it. So now let's talk about creating the outputs. A transaction output is created in the form of a script that creates an encumbrance and a value and can only be redeemed by the introduction of the solution of the script. In simpler terms, Alice's transaction output will contain a script that says something like, this output is payable to whoever can present a signature from the key corresponding to Bob's address because only Bob has the wallet with his private keys corresponding to that address, only Bob's wallet can present a digital signature to redeem the output. Alice will therefore essentially encumber the output value with a demand for a digital signature from Bob. This transaction will also include a second output because Alice's funds are in the form of a 0.1 BTC output, which is too much money for the 0.015 BTC cup of coffee. Alice will want 
0.085 BTC and change. Alice's change payment is created by Alice's wallet as an output in the very same transaction as Bob the payment, as the payment to Bob. Essentially, Alice's wallet breaks her funds into two payments, one to Bob and one back to herself. She can then use the change output in the subsequent transaction uh, with another merchant. Uh, finally, for the transaction to be processed by the network in a timely fashion, Alice's wallet application will add a small fee. Um, this is not explicit in the transaction, but it's implied by the difference between inputs and outputs. If instead of taking 0 0.085 and change, Alice creates only 0.0845 as second output, there will be 0 0.0005 BTC left over as the implicit change. Um, the resulting difference is a transaction fee is collected by the miner as a fee for validating and including the transaction in the block before in the blockchain. Um, and we saw, already saw this uh, when we looked at the Explorer earlier, but basically here you can see, again, another printout of this showing there's an input of 0.1, an output, uh, you know, the fees, um, and going to these two addresses, 0 0.015 to Bob the Merchant and 0 0.0845 as going back to Alice for her change. Uh, one thing you can notice is it doesn't actually say Bob or Alice here, it just says their address. Um, so adding the transaction to the ledger, the transaction created by Alice's wallet application is you know, 250 bytes long, contains everything necessary to confirm ownership of the funds and assign new owners to the currency. Now the transaction is transmitted to the Bitcoin network will become part of the blockchain. Uh, so we'll talk about how that transaction becomes part of a block and how the block is mined. And then we'll see how the block becomes trusted by the network. So because the transaction contains the information necessary to process, it doesn't matter how or where it's transmitted to the Bitcoin network. The Bitcoin network is a peer-to-peer -peer network with each Bitcoin client participating by connecting to several other Bitcoin clients. The purpose of the Bitcoin network is to propagate transactions and blocks to all the participants. So how does it do that? Well, any system such as server, desktop, desktop application or wallet that participates in the Bitcoin network is communicating on the Bitcoin protocol and is considered a Bitcoin node. Alice's wallet application can send the new transaction, any Bitcoin network node it's connected to over any kind of connection, wired, Wi-Fi, mobile, and so on. Her Bitcoin wallet does not have to be connected to Bob's wallet directly. And she doesn't have to use the internet connection offered by the cafe. Uh, any Bitcoin node that receives a valid transaction hasn't seen before will forward it to all the other nodes to which it's connected, uh, typically up to about eight other nodes. Thus, the transaction rapidly propagates across the peer-to-peer -peer network, reaching a large percentage of the nodes within a few seconds. If Bob's Bitcoin wallet application is directly connected to Alice's wallet application, Bob's wallet application might be the first node to receive the transaction. However, even if wallets app, Alice's wallet sends a transaction through other nodes, it's going to reach Bob's wallet within a few seconds. Bob's wallet will then immediately identify her transaction as an incoming payment because it contains outputs redeemable by Bob's private keys. Bob's wallet application can also independently verify that the transaction is well-formed, uses previously unspent outputs, and contains sufficient transaction fees to be included by miners in the next block. At this point, Bob can assume with little risk that the transaction will be included in a block and confirmed. Um, the author of the book points out that there's a common misperception about Bitcoin transactions that they have to be confirmed by waiting for up to an hour. Although confirmations assure that transactions have been accepted by the whole network, such a delay is typically unnecessary for small value items such as a cup of coffee. A merchant can accept a small value transaction with no confirmations with no more risk than a credit card payment made without a signature. Um, Bitcoin mining. Alice's transaction is now propagated on the Bitcoin network. It doesn't become part of the trans blockchain until it's verified and included in a block by a process called mining. The Bitcoin system of trust is based on computation. Transactions are bundled into blocks, which require an enormous amount of computation to prove, but only a small amount of computation to verify. The mining process serves two purposes in Bitcoin. Mining nodes validate the transactions by reference to Bitcoin's consensus rules. Therefore, mining provides security for Bitcoin transactions by rejecting invalid or malformed transactions. Mining also creates new Bitcoin in each block, almost like a central bank printing new money. The amount of Bitcoin created per block is limited and diminishes with time following a, a schedule. 
Mining achieves a fine balance between cost and reward. Mining uses electricity to solve a math problem. A successful miner will collect a block reward in the form of new Bitcoin and transaction fees. However, the reward will only be collected if the miners correctly validated the transactions to the satisfaction of the rules consensus. This balance provides security for Bitcoin without a central authority like the Federal Reserve. A good way to describe mining is like a giant competitive game of Sudoku that resets every time someone finds a solution and whose difficulty adjusts so it takes approximately 10 minutes to find a solution. Uh, imagine a giant Sudoku puzzle, several thousand rows and columns in size. If I show you a completed puzzle, you can verify it quite quickly. How if the puzzle has a few squares filled and the rest are empty, it'll take a lot of work to solve that puzzle. The difficulty of the Sudoku can be adjusted by changing its size, more or fewer rows and columns, but it can still be verified quite easily, even if it's very large. The puzzle used in Bitcoin is based on cryptographic hashing and exhibits similar characteristics in that it's hard to solve, but easy to verify, and its difficulty can be adjusted. Um, in the user stories section in chapter one, the authors introduce Jing, an entrepreneur in Shanghai. Jing runs a mining farm, which is a business that runs thousands of specialized mining computers competing for the reward. Every 10 minutes or so, Jing's mining computers compete against thousands of similar systems in a global race to find a solution to a block of transactions. Finding such a solution, the so-called proof of work, requires uh, quadrillions of hashing operations per second across the entire Bitcoin network. The algorithm for proof of work involves repeatedly hashing the header of the block and a random number with a SHA-256 cryptographic hashing algorithm until a solution matching a predetermined pattern emerges. The first miner to find such a solution wins a round of competition and publishes a block into the blockchain. Um, in this particular example, Jing started mining in 2010 using a desktop computer to find a suitable proof of work. As more mining, miners started joining the Bitcoin network, the difficulty of the problem increased. Soon, Jing and other miners have graded to more specialized hardware with graphical processing units. Uh, often used in gaming desktops or consoles. Uh, then uh, it became profitable to mine Bitcoin using ASIC, application-specific integrated circuits. Essentially, hundreds of mining algorithms printed into hardware running in parallel on silicon chips. Uh, Jing's company also participates in a mining pool, which is much like a lottery pool, allowing several participants to share their efforts and rewards. Uh, Jing's company now runs a warehouse full of thousands of ASIC miners to mine for Bitcoin 24 hours a day. The company pays its electricity costs by selling the Bitcoin it is able to generate from mining, creating some Bitcoin income from the profits. Mining transactions and blocks. New transactions are constantly flowing in the network from user wallets and other applications. As these are seen by the Bitcoin network nodes, they get added to a temporary pool of unverified transactions maintained by each node. As miners construct a new block, they add unverified transactions from this pool to the new block and then attempt to prove the validity of that new block with the mining algorithm, uh, proof of work. The process of mining is, is detailed further in the section on mining. Transactions are added to the new block prioritized by the highest fee transactions first and a few other criteria. Each miner starts the process of mining a new block of transactions as soon as they receive the previous block from the network, knowing they have lost that previous round of competition unless they were the lucky winner. They immediately create a new block, fill it with transactions and the fingerprint of the previous block and start calculating the proof of work for the new block. Each miner includes a special transaction in their block, one that pays their own Bitcoin address, the block reward, uh, plus the sum of transaction fees from all the transactions included in the block. If they find a solution that makes that block valid, they win this reward because their successful block is added to the global blockchain and the reward to the pool address. From there, a share of the reward is distributed to Jing and other miners in proportion to the amount of work they contributed in the last round. Alice's transaction was picked up by the network and included in the pool of unverified transactions. Once validated by the mining software, it was included in a new block called a candidate block generated by Jing's mining pool. All the miners participating in that mining pool immediately start computing proof of work for the candidate block. Approximately five minutes after the transaction was first transmitted by Alice's wallet, one of Jing's ASIC miners found a solution for the candidate block and announced it to the network. Once other miners validate the winning block, uh, the race restarts 
and they, they start trying to generate the next block. Gene's winning block becomes part of the blockchain as block 277316, containing 419 transactions, including Ellis's transaction. The block containing Ellis's transaction is counted as one confirmation of that transaction. And you can see the block that included Ellis's transaction. Let's go back to our blockchain over here. We've got this transaction. You can see you've got the hash of the transaction. You get the inputs and the outputs. We scroll down here, we got the hash, wait, and here is our block, 277316. If we click on it here on the Explorer, it shows us the block. It says this block was mined in December 2013 at 5 p.m. CST. Um, it currently has 407,000 confirmations. That's the list of how many blocks there's been since then. So there's been four, over 400,000 blocks since 2013. Uh, it tells you back then there was a block reward of 25 BTC, um, which nowadays uh, the block rewards are like six. Uh, they've gone down significantly since then. Uh, but the value of the BTC has gone up. Um, here we've got the hash of the block, we get the confirmations, number of transactions, there were 400 transactions in that block, uh, the difficulty of the block, and so on. So let's go back to the textbook. So approximately 20 minutes later after that block, there was a new block that was 277317 that was mined by another miner. Um, you'll remember I mentioned earlier that blocks come out on an average of 10 minutes, um, and, but it is variable. And so in this case, it was 20 minutes later. Because this new block is built on top of block 277316 that contained Ellis's transaction, it's essentially adding more computation to the blockchain and it strengthens the trust in the transactions from in 2007. 7316. So each block mined on top of the one containing the transaction counts as an additional confirmation for Alice's transaction. As the blocks pile on top of each other, it becomes exponentially harder to reverse the transaction, thereby making it more and more trusted by the network. In the diagram in Alice's transaction, including in block 27736, we can see block 27736, which contains Alice's transaction. Below it are um, all the previous blocks links to each other in a chain of blocks all the way back to block number zero known as the genesis block. Over time, as the height in blocks increases, so does the computation difficulty for each block in the chain as a whole. The blocks mined after the one that contains Ellis's transaction act as further assurance as they pile on more computation in a longer and longer chain. By convention, any block with more than six confirmations is considered irrevocable because it would require an immense amount of computation to validate and recalculate six blocks. I mean, in theory, it can be done, but it would be extremely difficult. Um, so here we're seeing this diagram. Uh, we've got 277316, Alice's transaction. When 277317 comes in, now you're, you're going multiple blocks deeper. And you know, obviously, when there's zero blocks deep, uh, it's easier to confirm, but as you add these blocks, that transaction gets harder and harder to revoke. Uh, and obviously there's a Genesis block, the very first block in the blockchain. So now that Alice's transaction has been embedded in the blockchain as part of a block, it is part of the distributed ledger of Bitcoin and visible to all Bitcoin applications. Each Bitcoin client can independently verify the transaction as well and spendable. Full node clients can track the source of the funds from the moment the block of Bitcoin were first generated in a block, incrementally from transaction to transaction until they reach Bob's address. Lightweight clients can do what is called a simplified payment verification by confirming that the transaction is in the blockchain and has several blocks mined after. Thus providing assurance the miners accepted it as valid. Bob can now spend the output from this and other transactions. For example, Bob can pay a contractor or supplier by transferring some of the Bitcoin from Alice's coffee cup payment to these new owners. Uh, Bob's Bitcoin software will likely aggregate many small payments into a larger payment, uh, perhaps concentrating all the day's Bitcoin revenue in a single transaction, aggregating the various payments into an output. For a diagram of aggregating transactions, you can take a look at when we talked about uh, transaction aggregating funds. As Bob spends the payments received from Alice and other customers, 
He extends a chain of transactions. Let's assume that Bob pays his web designer, Kopesh and Bangalore for a new web page. Now the chain of transactions uh, will show from Joe's wallet to Alice's wallet to Bob's wallet to Gopesh's wallet. And at each point along the chain, you're gonna see change outputs in addition to the payments. As we see in this diagram here, where transaction one was from Joe to Alice, then transaction two is from Alice to Bob, and then transaction three is from Bob to Gopesh. Um, so in chapter two, we looked at how transactions build a chain that moves from value from owner to owner. Um, the, the authors also tracked Alice's transaction from the moment it was created in her wallet through the Bitcoin network and to the miners who recorded on the blockchain. In the rest of this book, the author is going to examine the specific technologies behind wallets, addresses, signatures, transactions, the network, and mining. So thanks for uh, watching this video, and we'll be back with some more videos as we go deeper into the world of Bitcoin.